Welcome to this Encore Learning presentation on diplomacy as a key tool to nurturing and defending American democracy. I'm excited to be speaking to you today because I'm excited about the Encore Learning presentation and the people who take part in this program. People who have a reputation for wanting to be informed. So I'm hoping to give you information and ideas that you can use. And if you have questions or comments, at the end of the presentation, I will be providing you with my email address and will respond to them. So if you look at my book cover, bombs, bullets, and the tank at the office, you're thinking, what does that have to do with diplomats and diplomacy? And I would note that I've been in harm's way in more zones of conflict than a number of military personnel I know. If you look at my next slide, this is the State Department's memorial wall at Washington DC, of which there are several, and they are currently constructing yet another. These walls pay tribute to those men and women of the diplomatic service who made the ultimate sacrifice. And the walls begin as far back as 1780 with William Palfrey, who was lost at sea. And they go through the 1800s, John Flint dying trying to save someone from drowning. You see yellow fever and epidemics noted on these walls. And these threats continue through to today, think COVID-19. And we recently lost uh, an American diplomat in India. Our diplomats face threats daily across the globe, including from civil strife and terrorism. And if you look at this last slide, you see Michelle Denny O'Connor, who died when the US Embassy in Nairobi was bombed in August of 1998. Um, I personally miss being blown up by about 10 hours because I had flown out of Nairobi early on the morning of that day. But I've experienced gun and mortar fire, dealt with landmines in Mozambique and Burundi, and with the tank at the office, about which more later. But as to why now my book, I spent 25 years defending democracy and exercising diplomacy as a way to help resolve the world's problems and to keep these threats away from the American homeland. So I've been appalled over the past few years to see democracy and diplomacy and practitioners of both, people putting themselves in harm's way to defend Americans and America, under increasing attack here at home, culminating in the heartbreaking attack on the nation's capital on January 6th. I felt I had to speak up and to call to others to speak up and speak out because that attack on our nation's capital is not who we are. So my presentation today is in three parts. Diplomacy, what it is and why it is so important for the United States. And I call this part true, false, or urban myth because I address a number of misconceptions about diplomacy. The second part of my talk is about my 25 plus years of service and gives examples of diplomacy in action, and I call this your tax dollars at work. And the third part of critical importance is a call to action to us as Americans. We can and must be good citizens, which means listening to others respectfully, yes, perhaps disagreeing, but civilly and working together to find common ground to move forward on today's challenges to make our communities, our states, and our world a better place. So on to my first part, a primer on diplomacy. And I'm going to share with you the US Department of State mission statement. Diplomats work to create a more secure, democratic, and prosperous world for the benefit of the American people and the international community. And I would also give you a um, definition. American diplomats are known as foreign service officers, which means 
I was willing in foreign countries far from home to serve as a professional to engage with the world to protect the United States, its people, and its strategic national interests. Now, this section of my book goes into a lot of depth on the rules and regulations that govern American diplomats, how we are apolitical, although unfortunately our reporting on facts can and has been politicized, with our oath to the Constitution of the United States and not to any one person or political office. But I'm, I'm really today gonna stress the mission statement, the basics. And I'm gonna go into greater depth about secure, democratic, and prosperous. So more secure, not just from terrorism, but also from threats such as Ebola and now the COVID-19 pandemic, from pollution and economic threats, think the cyber attacks that recently disrupted gas supplies on our East Coast. We work with other countries to protect against threats, which all too often do not respect national boundaries. And more democratic. We are by no means perfect but the strength of our democracy lies in institutions with checks and balances in our people and in our ability to admit our imperfections and take steps to address them. And I'll give you a personal example of uh, my career that almost did not happen. And I'm gonna give you a photo of my junior officer training class back in the 1980s it was considered very diverse. And it, you see, it has a handful of women. I'm off on the right side between the pillars. No minorities. This was considered very diverse. And in fact, I had taken what was purported to be a, an unbiased test to get into the Foreign Service. And I received a... Um, feedback from the board of examiners that said, oh, Ms. Stricker, passing this year was a 92, and you only received a 95, um, so you failed. And I'm not a math major, but I figured if I'd scored higher on the test than the passing score, that should have meant that I passed. Now, I was working at the time for the Department of State as a counterterrorism intelligence analyst, as a civil service, uh, civil servant, and a fairly recent hire. And I thought, you know, who am I to call up the Department of State and say, hey, I think you made a mistake? But I did. And they said, oh, yes, you know, you did pass. And who knows if I hadn't made that call? And who knew that at that time, women in the Department of State and particularly foreign service officers faced with this blatant discrimination. Women who passed the test were not being offered jobs. Men who scored lower were. Um, and then once women were offered employment, they were offered positions as consular officers in Africa, for example, instead of what, what were considered the more prestigious political officer positions in places such as London or Paris. So women in the Foreign Service initiated a lawsuit against the Department of State. They spoke up, they spoke out, they won, and they worked for years with the Department of State to address this discrimination. Now, this is not to say we, the Department of State is now perfect. We continue to work to employ minorities and to, to have a stronger foreign service that represents us all. But I contrast that with a woman I worked with at an African country. She was a foreign national working at the US Embassy. She was royalty in her country. Her very uh, forward-leaning parents had sent her abroad to study at a pre prestigious international university. She came back 
um, to her foreign ministry with her, um, uh, her degree in international affairs, with her connections, with her brilliance. And she said to her foreign service, I am here to serve. And they looked at her and they saw just a woman. And they said, oh yes, we will be happy to have you serve tea. So she came to the US Embassy, understanding she would be recognized for her talents and her abilities. And she helped the US Embassy tremendously um, advance our national strategic interests and not coincidentally helped her country with, uh, helped her country also move forward. So if you think of the last one then, which is um, more prosperous, um, this ranges from everything to working international trade and commercial agreements, to strengthening rule of law, supporting education, all those things that help people work towards a good life, have a family and be able to feed and support them. Particularly today when terrorism is the scourge of so many countries, the fodder for terrorists is youth who have no hope for justice, security, or the basic opportunity to lead decent lives. Diplomacy strives to bring hope to nations and people. And a final note from this first part of my book, diplomacy is not expensive. Historically, as former Secretary of State John Kerry noted, Americans have believed that foreign aid accounts for as much as a quarter to a third of the federal budget. In fact, diplomacy, which includes our diplomatic facilities and personnel, accounts for about two to three cents per dollar of the discretionary cost of the federal budget, which does not even include social security and other mandatory programs, making the percentage uh, of this budget that much smaller. And I'm not gonna throw a lot of numbers at you, but when I do use numbers on the military, for example, these numbers will come straight from Pentagon sources or federal budget numbers will come from the Congressional Research Service. So we're talking pennies on the dollars and yet the Berlin Wall came down without a shot being fired which is not to say the military is not essential, but the voice of America, information, ideas, our openness and our example brought down the wall. And I'm gonna give you more food for thought. Um, a very interesting website is the Brown University uh, website, which talks about the cost of war. And it's striking not just for information on the dollar cost of war, but for information on how many places the US military has acted. And if you look, everywhere there is a spot on this map, that means the US military is active and potentially shooting. And it shows us our tendency to use military options when other measures might be more appropriate. And I think back to when I was acting ambassador in one country and I got a call on a secure line from a military commander. He said, hey, you know, we're in your country. We're going after some bad guys. Do you have intelligence for us that we can use? And I thought, I thought at a minimum, I don't want any American dying on my watch. So I said, look, this is a bad neck of the world. It's been for centuries. There are bad actors where you're going and it's their backyard. So I said, prepare for the worst. And nobody died on my watch. Fast forward to 2017 in Niger, and I'm just giving you a map of Africa where remember US military are involved here across Africa. And you see Niger towards the top of the map and we're looking even closer at it, the Niger, which 
Northern Niger, where these troops were in 20, US troops were in 2017, it's practically up in the Sahara Desert. So US soldiers going after bad guys were ambushed, four US soldiers died. This showed up on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post, and rightly so, as Americans began to question our military presence in so many places, with seemingly little oversight. But let's talk specifics on dollars and cents, the cost of war versus diplomacy. And I'm going to compare the first and second Gulf Wars. Leaving aside the wars diplomats had prevented or stopped, in the 1990 to 91 uh, first Gulf War, the United States had a fact-based plan forged by military and diplomatic area experts who persuaded 38 allied nations to support the plan. This coalition got Iraq out of Kuwait for um, it was eight, uh, 61 billion of which the United States paid about 7 billion. Our allies paid 54 billion and fought and died with us. Contrast that to the second Gulf War, which had a bad plan, bad intelligence about the weapons of mass destruction and few allies. Um, the Congressional Research Service noted that this war cost the United States 784 billion or over a hundred times the cost of the first Gulf War. Add in the cost of the incredible upheaval this war caused in the Middle East for which we're still paying. And it's clear that the foresight and diplomacy uh, for preparing for the first Gulf War led to a much less costly conflict. And let's talk about the moral cost. The second Gulf War was not considered a just war. We undermined our reputation with our allies and this impacts our ability to do business with them even today. And opportunity costs, I'll quote a US general, uh, Dwight Eisenhower as far back as 1953 noted, we pay for a single destroyer with new houses that could have housed more than 8,000 people. Fast forward, Times Magazine in December 2018 quotes former Secretary of Defense Mattis, who said similar things on numerous occasions, including in testimony before Congress, that basically, if you don't give more money to diplomacy, you're gonna have to give the military a heck of a lot more money for guns and ammunition. And I'm gonna leave you with a final thought as the US Embassy in Baghdad was increasing exponentially as we were trying to help rebuild that country, we did not have enough Americans to staff it. So the US Department of State put out a call to our foreign service nationals, um, people who had been working as political assistants, consular assistants, in budget shops, um, personnel, warehousing, contracting, um, across the board, helping build the platform from which US diplomats exercise diplomacy. And again, the, the Department of State called upon these foreign service nationals, uh, people from other countries, foreigners working at US embassies to help staff our embassy in Baghdad to go into harm's way. And I was working in a former Soviet country and one of my staffers came to me and he said, Carol, I want to volunteer to go to Baghdad. He said, when the US invade, when the Soviets invaded my country, they disappeared my father. Disappeared being the euphemism for they took his father from his home in the middle of the night. The family never recovered his body or found out what happened to him. His father 
had been the village schoolmaster, educated, um, respected in the village, willing to speak up and speak out on what he perceived to be problems. So he was considered by the Soviets, and rightly so, to be a threat to their regime. So my employee, he said, when the US came to my country, not invaded, when the US came to my country, your country freed my country and brought truth and democracy to it. I want to go to Baghdad and help America do the same for Iraq. This is a key point in my book. This loyalty to American ideals can neither be bought nor bombed into existence. It is a testimony to what America once stood for in the world and can stand for again. It is the America that I was proud to represent as a diplomat. It is the America that the world needs today. And just a reminder, if you have questions, comments, you will be getting my email address. So now to the second part of my talk, which is your tax dollars at work. And I had just talked about the cost of war, and I'm gonna talk about my two-year tour in Kiev, Ukraine. If you look at the map, Kiev, KYIV is at the top, right next door to Chernobyl, which many of you will remember for the Chernobyl nuclear accident, which resulted in over $200 billion in damages and has contaminated that area for thousands of years. This was an accident. Think of what a nuclear war would do. So I'm very proud of my work in Ukraine, not only helping build that nascent democracy, but helping rid it of thousands of nuclear weapons, which by the way, we're targeting the US. So in 1994, President Clinton visited Ukraine and I supported this visit. And he signed off on a trilateral agreement with Ukraine and Russia, which under which Russia and the US agreed to uh, support and support the Ukrainian government and respect, respect their territorial, uh, their territory. And of course we know today that there are Russians on Ukrainian soil, but um, I would argue that the agreement was a good agreement. I think that we failed in follow through on, following through on it and on enforcing it. But um, back to the 1994 visit and within months, I had signed off on a $1.2 million check to buy the concrete to fill in the missile silos and to build housing for demobilized troops. Other programs found jobs for nuclear scientists and technicians so they wouldn't sell their expertise to terrorist or rogue states. Now, the other thing I did was help Ukraine develop their democracy. And it, it was basically the wild, wild west. The country itself was rebuilding as an independent country. And the embassy itself was, shall we say, under construction. So you see the presidential visit to Ukraine, myself, I'm center with the Blue Beret and my staff, and a construction site, which was the embassy. And my first day on the job, you know, I was dressed in a suit, professionally attired, and I discovered I was gonna be working with three others out of a construction trailer. And in the very cold Ukrainian winters, whoever had to type up the reports got the sole space heater that the electrical system could accommodate so they could take off their gloves or mittens and actually type without freezing their fingers. So, hey, I'm flexible, ready for anything. and. Um, I settled in that first day, realized I needed a restroom break. So I stepped out of the office and I saw the porta potties across a sea of mud. Now, fortunately, we had cleared American guards on site, 
who were there to protect uh, the site and supervise it and to keep it, to keep, uh, for example, the construction workers bugging the construction as they had done earlier at Embassy Moscow. So one of these cleared American guards, he saw me, figured out my dilemma, came over to me and he said, do you need a lift? And I thought about it and I thought, yes. So he swept me up in his arms and he carried me off to the porta potty and then he brought me back to work. And um, the next day I made sure I had my trusty hiking boots with me. As I helped build the embassy, which tripled in size while I was there over my two year tour. I was the 30th officer out. By the time I left, we had 90 American officers and we tripled the size of the local staff. But as, as I was building the embassy, Ukraine was building its country. And on any given day, I either had to deal with old Soviet law or new parliamentary legislation from their RADA or presidential decree, think tweet. And so any on any given day, as I was trying to find, you know, buy and lease housing for the new Americans out at post, I was either a black market speculator stealing the Ukrainian soul, or I was the new spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism that was going to bring hope and democracy and prosperity to Ukraine. And remember, I talked about prosperity as part of the US Department of State's mission statement. And you can't be, you can't prosper if you don't know the rules, if the rules change on you from day to day. I was fortunate, I was working at the embassy. Think of the businessmen and women who were trying to invest in Ukraine. Think of the Ukrainians themselves who didn't know what was legal or illegal from day to day. But from macro to micro, I made a difference in this country. Um, I talked about getting rid of thousands of nuclear weapons. I was also so pleased to hear as my employees came into work, the few who had cars, oh, Carol, we weren't stopped today for bribes by the police. And oh, you know, we're not paying bribes for this service. So at all levels, things were improving. And I have to admit, this tour was made more easy for me because the Department of State had sent me to Ukrainian training for eight months. Now, back as far back as the SARS, if you spoke Ukrainian or advocated for the Ukrainian culture, you could be beaten, you could be jailed, you could be exiled to Siberia, you could be killed. So in newly independent Ukraine, I would go into my counterparts' offices and they would have Ukrainian dictionaries on their book desks, Ukrainian grammar books. They too were trying to improve and build on their Ukrainian language and culture. And the fact that the US government respected the country and the culture enough to send me to Ukraine, to pay for me to go to Ukrainian training for eight months, that just helped our reputation and helped us achieve our goals so much more easily. Now, the next tour that I'm gonna talk about is in Africa. And if you think about it, um, at the time I was in Ukraine, the US Department of State understanding that people, including Congress thought we were spending too much money on foreign affairs. The Department of State said, we will open up 13 new posts with no new money and no new people. So they did, and they took people and money from other posts across the globe to set these new embassies up. So I had gone to Africa and I did a two year rover tour, fill, going to posts from anywhere for, from a couple of weeks to a month or more. And I would fill two to four jobs at a time 
trying to fill in the holes in operations and trying to address the priority needs of these posts. So these embassies, these US missions could continue to work on strategic American objectives. And one of my more interesting tours was in Burundi. This was, um, the country had just experienced a coup. The president of the country had taken refuge in the American embassy. And I was sent in um, to do whatever I could to get the embassy back on an even footing and particularly to help prepare it in case they needed to evacuate. So I got to Burundi and I had to fly a United Nations flight in because there were no flights flying uh, due to the economic embargo, uh, again, due to the coup. And I got to the airport and I was met by a US military officer and he said, oh, welcome. He said, I'm gonna drive you past the embassy past the administrative annex where you'll mostly be working, show you to your house, and then you're gonna drive me back to the airport because I'm gonna get on this plane and get out of here. I thought, okay, you know, hadn't been briefed on that, but I can handle it. So I drove him back to the airport, drove home, caught an early sleep, and uh, got to the administrative annex early the next day because I wanted to check out the facility, check out my assets before my employees arrived. So I noted that, you know, we had vehicles and we had a gas pump in case we needed to bug out. Uh, and I noticed we had no keys for them. And then around 8.15, I also noticed, hmm, nobody has showed up for work. So I called into the embassy and I said, what does it mean when nobody shows up for work? And um, I was told, well, we've been trying to get a hold of you on your emergency radio to let you know that there have been landmine planted in the city center over which I'd just driven. And we're telling everybody to stay home till 10, by which time, hopefully the landmines will have been cleared. Now I had my emergency radio with me, but it was lunchbox size, fairly heavy. So when I got to the office, I put it in the office while I walked around the grounds. And um, so around 10 o'clock, I walked over to the embassy and that's when I was disconcerted to find out I had to walk by the tank that was pointing directly at the embassy where the president of the country had taken refuge. And I found out that um, there were, well, I found out from my motor pool supervisor that he'd been taking the keys home for the vehicles and the gas pump because um, inflation was extraordinary in that country such that local currency was worth nothing. And he was trying to protect these valuable assets. The problem was he also lived on the wrong side of the city, uh, on the other side of the landmines from the administrative annex. But I was able to, thankfully, get Washington to increase the embassy's funding and particularly to get authorization to pay for everything in US dollars. Because again, the due to the economic embargo and sky inflation, local currency was valueless. My embassy uh, cashier kept running out of money to, to pay for embassy operations. But with changing to a US dollar economy, we could in fact fund our needs and pay for our employees instead of you know, just giving them, giving them nothing as their salaries. The other thing I did in Burundi, I attended a high level reception, uh, which included uh, a number of people from other countries and uh, Burundians from both sides of the conflict. And if you remember the map of Africa, 
Burundi is right next door to Rwanda, which is infamous for the genocide that occurred there. Burundi had the same ethnicities, the same issues, but through US diplomatic efforts and uh, efforts by other countries, we were able to prevent a genocide in that country. So, um, and, and since I talked about receptions, um, which I attended to gather and share information and try to influence people, I'm gonna mention another part of bureaucracy, the M word or meetings. And yeah, we've all been to bad meetings, but they can be surprisingly good. In Africa, I attended a meeting monthly um, hosted by the number two, uh, the deputy chief of mission at the American mission. So, you know, this was given a lot of attention and it included not only people from other foreign embassies, but from non-governmental organizations. And we all sat at the same table and we talked about what our priorities were in the country and what the country's priorities were and how we could actually help. And everybody went around the table and said, oh, well, we can do X, but we can't do Y, or we can supply these resources. And it was a beautiful meeting because it avoided duplication of efforts. It, it made sure that we really targeted what we were planning on doing it provided feedback on if programs were successful or not, and then we would move towards other programs. It made sure that for all of us in that country, we were working our tax dollars as effectively as possible. So moving along, um, it was not all work. Um, I was able to get to world heritage sites and other just fascinating venues, um, in part because many of the countries in which I worked had very poor airline service. So often I was stuck there like over weekends and I tried to, you know, I was working 10 and 12 hour days, but I made sure to also get out of it and meet the country and meet the people of the country. So I was able in Northern Niger, for example, to see these six to 8,000 year old rock carvings. Um, I met great people. Um, and I'm gonna show you um, a little bit about getting around. Yes, I've ridden camels, I've ridden Jeeps. Um, I had my handy Toyota. And um, in one country, uh, I remember over a weekend, an American citizen was in distress and the American officer who needed to go into the embassy was on the wrong side of this, what we call the submersible bridge. And it was totally submersed. So this creative officer who went down to the riverbank, gave some money to a, a fisherman, a local fisherman to ferry him across, got to the embassy, helped the American and all was good. But so, you know, we help American citizens in distress, American businesses. Did you know we also help, for example, Dr. Paul Sereno with the University of Chicago, helping him with um, supporting documents and liaison with the Niger government when he did his archeological dig and discovered Super Croc, which is on the left, upper left, which was a, millions of year old uh, fossil that was featured in Smithsonian Magazine. So, you know, we do it all, we're there for you. I was also able to take advantage of work to visit this raptor refuge site and Samarkand, which was on the Silk Road to China. And this kind of will segue into one of my European postings as the deputy director to Frankfurt's Regional Support Center. And again, I have to emphasize your tax dollars at work. As the US military was downsizing in Europe and the US embassies were upsizing with no money, no resources, no personnel, 
The regional support center was the nexus which connected surplus military supplies and equipment with these posts that needed them. And so, for example, when I was in Ukraine, I flew down to the regional support center and the U.S. Embassy Kiev had paid a couple of thousand dollars to refurbish a military, a U.S. military surplus truck. We filled it to the roof with um, surplus U.S. military supplies, tools, furniture, furnishings, and we drove it back to Ukraine and we kept the U.S. Embassy running for months on this infusion of resources, which we could not have afforded and would not have reached us in a timely manner if we had all, gone all the way back to the United States to purchase these items. And we could not get them in Ukraine, in Kiev at that time. And the US military, of course, uh, is not then having to send all these things back at prohibitive prices to the United States or, um, or throw them away because they would not have sold in uh, in Europe. One of the other things I did as the deputy director of this regional support center was I provided training to these many new posts. And again, cost effectively, instead of sending, you know, a dozen new uh, consular staff from a post all the way back to, to the US for training, we might conceivably bring them to Germany, or even better, we would take a consular, a, a, again, a foreign service national who'd been working on like consular issues for decades. We would send that one person into the new embassy for a week, train up all the new staff for a fraction, a tenth of the cost of what it would have taken to send those half dozen or 10 people all the way back to the States. So if you look at the map of Europe again, you can see Germany centrally located um, and excellent logistic uh, strategic location, not only to conduct war, but to conduct diplomacy and to get all these resources into the former Soviet Union posts that needed them. And I'm gonna end with this section of the talk with two US assignments that I had. And one was as the special assistant to the assistant secretary for oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs. And um, this was a wonderful job. We dealt with everything from ocean uh, depths to outer space. And in 1995, I helped support a United Nations environmental program conference at which 110 countries agreed to take specific measures to reduce pollution in the world's oceans. This protected the livelihood of fishermen, of the tourist industry, protected the health of people living along the ocean's uh, banks and also the health of the planet. So diplomacy can be painstaking. Obviously that agreement took months and a lot of hard work, but 110 countries taking specific action against pollution, the results are worth it. Not that we're always successful, we must not only convince foreign nations to work to the good, but we must also convince our own country. We must present facts, even when they are not what our leaders and politicians want to hear. We speak truth to power. We're not always heard, and this is not new. During the 1950s, um, you may remember McCarthyism and the Red Scare, U.S. diplomats stated in stationed in China alerted the US government to the fact that the Chinese communists would very likely win out over the nationalist for control of China. Senator Joseph McCarthy in a very sad chapter in American history attacked these messengers and ruined their careers and even damaged their lives with baseless allegations. 
Today, many of you heard of the Department of State's official dissent shell, which dates back to the Vietnam War um, and provides a powerful forum for alternative views that diplomats believe must be heard. And at the time of the Vietnam War, we were speaking up saying, hey, we are not winning the war. Um, in more recent years, diplomats have used this dissent channel to speak out against genocide, our policies in Iraq. And, but remember how I talked about how our information can be politicized. Dissent channel information is not for public dissemination. It's to aid the government in its eternal deliberations and to make sure that diplomats aren't afraid of bringing forth information that, again, our leaders, our, our top politicians may not want to hear. Um, but dissent channel cables, dissent channel documents have been leaked to the press and have been politicized. And you've also heard stories of diplomats who they go through the channels, they feel they're not making a difference, and they resign in protest against what they feel are bad policies that they feel are making the US weaker. So I ended my career as an associate dean at the Department of State's National Foreign Affairs Training Center. You may know it as the Foreign Service Institute or FSI. And here again, your tax dollars at work. I used my expertise and my experiences um, to improve training and particularly distance learning. Um, I expanded exponentially our online learning programs, which help everybody from family members to diplomats better do their jobs. And I think of just one example, we had a number of uh, very uh, proficient Spanish speakers. And we had one who was assigned to Portuguese, Portugal, which Spanish and Portuguese are very similar. So we had a distance, language, distance learning program that this officer used on his own time. And normally to learn Portuguese, we would send someone to the Foreign Service Institute for three months, up to three months, full-time study. And he was able to turn his Spanish into Portuguese, proficient level Portuguese on his own time in less than two months. So the program paid for itself with just one person. And for more targeted training, again, I give you the example of our students, our diplomats going to Afghanistan. They would learn Pashto, for example, and as they became proficient, they would participate in simulated exercises of the village elder meetings where the instructors would pay, play the village elders and they would talk about, oh, the Taliban are stealing our children or, you know, your bomb blew up my goats. Things that they would actually need to be talking about with village elders once they got to post. So targeted, cost effective, and making all of our diplomats better able to achieve American strategic goals. So again, quick break, stop for tea, um, because I'm going to go into the most critical part of my talk a call to action to all of you to see what's going on in our communities, in our country and the world, to think analytically, discuss civilly and take action. Now, the call to action in my book calls on the judiciary to ensure not justice for the wealthy, but justice for all, calls upon the media and particularly social media to be accurate and honest and above all civil to politicians, not to kick the can down the road, but to address the burning issues of today, to be civil and work collegially towards the common good. But my emphasis in today's talk 
focuses on all of us as private citizens. Understandably, with so many challenges today, an individual can't do it all. But together, if we each do our part, we can make the world a better place. So pick a passion, whether you focus on your community, on your state, on our country, or global issues. Again, we can make a difference together. We cannot make a difference sitting back complacently, waiting for others to take care of us, or just bad-mouthing or arguing against things we disagree with. Okay. And I, I would ask you at a minimum, be an informed voter. And I've, I've been appalled. Um, Americans in presidential elections, historically, perhaps half of eligible voters vote. And I'm not even going to go into the abysmal percentages of voters who vote in local elections, which are so critical to our communities. If you think about the 2016 election, again, about half Americans voted, and um, of those half, uh, less than half voted for, our, for President Trump, who won in the Electoral College. So if you think about it, a quarter of Americans elected our president. I contrast that with countries in which I've served, where people have been beaten, killed, and even killed for advocating for and trying to exercise their right to vote. They've walked miles, uh, they've stood in the burning sun for hours. And yet here, I often hear of excuses and a lot of times it's complacency or, oh, it's too inconvenient to vote. And I've also heard that, oh, you know, there's so much information out there, how can we become an informed voter? So I'm going to talk in this section about two documents uh, that I prepared. And again, if you email me, I will send them to you. The first was from an advanced English as a second language class I taught for immigrants who are trying to better themselves to get better jobs, have a better life in this country. And it was prepared for me by a co-teacher who was a uh, former librarian from the Library of Congress. And it's a collection of articles and websites that tell you how to tell truth from fiction on, on the World Wide Web. And my, you know, my um, English as a second language learners, I was telling them, you know, go to the web, improve your English, and they would come back to me, but we're not sure what we're seeing. How do we know that it's false or true? And many of you may not have that issue, um, but I found this presentation by this librarian was beautiful. You can select um, an article from a CIA officer, hey, this is how I tell truth from fiction, this was my job, or a teacher presenting to her students in high school and middle school, or a, um, a librarian uh, telling clients coming into the library, this is how I can help you. And he provided a number of um, the fact checker sites. So very useful uh, pamphlet. And the second one was something that I prepared for the Foreign Service Institute in retirement. Diplomats, as, the, as with the military, we are what's called an up or out organization. Um, if you don't keep doing well, uh, you are forcibly let go. And um, because of the hardships that we face during our service, um, we can retire as early as 50. We face mandatory retirement at 65. So you have diplomats uh, coming back from decades overseas and they have two kids in college, they still need a job. And, the t and Congress in its wisdom actually authorized a job search program for the Department of State that diplomats can attend to help them reconnect to America. They, they know Americana at large, but they might not know how to go on social media or network to get a job. And what I prepared 
for this program was a who, what, why, when, where, how to um, get connected, to help figure out a passion, to help figure out um, how you want to follow that passion. Um, do you want to be online? Do you want to be out meeting with people? And um, one example I gave from my own experience, I wanted to continue with the advocacy in retirement for uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons, for peace building. And so I identified a Quaker organization, which you do not have to be a Quaker to join, called the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And the beauty of this organization is they have paid staffers who follow a number of issues, um, issues that I believe in. And they provide talking points and they will give you alerts, oh, this information is coming up for vote in Congress on the state, or you know, maybe you should call your uh, senator or congressman to advocate. And again, they give you talking points and then they have thousands of volunteers such as myself across the United States who take this information and build up, use it to build on their own experiences and then go lobby Congress. And I personally lobbied my senator and senators and my congressmen a number of times over several years. And I always hear back from the staffers, thank you for coming. We want to hear from, from real citizens, from real people, because they, they know, they hear from the military and the military industrial complex lobbyists who are paid and have, have an agenda. And they want to hear what, what you know, their, their constituents are, are talking about and, and how we're feeling. So again, if you'd like that, pamphlet, I'd be happy to send it to you. But in closing, I hope you've learned a little bit about what diplomacy is and why it's so important to democracy. I hope I've convinced you through my story that your tax dollars are spent on diplomacy, are hard at work, and that diplomacy is not only effective, but cost effective. I hope I've inspired you to support our democracy, diplomacy, and practitioners of both, and particularly um, to find and follow your passion to help make our communities, our nation, and the world a better place for us all. Now here, I've included contact information on this side if you want to hear more about the Foreign Service and diplomats or some diplomatic issue, get in touch with the, the Speakers Bureau at speakers at afsa.org or look at the Foreign Service Association's website. It is our professional organization and read about the Foreign Service. And if you'd like to learn more about me or my book, contact me at diplomatstricker at outlook.com um, I know some local libraries have my book available or they're available online, uh, either as eBooks or paper copies. And if you'd like to learn more about the great uh, Encore Learning programs, which are everything from the fanciful, you know, how to do crossword puzzles to the historical Jamestown Rediscovery, archaeology and relevance of church and state. That again, uh, I've provided you the uh, contact for them. And I, at this point, um, I'd like to thank you for listening in. And I wish you success in your efforts to be a good citizen and help America address the many challenges that we face today. So thank you very much.